A long time ago, in a kingdom far, far away, stood a lovely little cottage on the edge of the great woods near the banks of the inland seas itself. And in this cottage lived a kind and pleasant maid named Isabel. Isabel was happy and content with her lovely little cottage and often spent her days wandering around the fields and meadows, picking flowers and catching butterflies, finding treasures in the simple things that filled her world. She often roamed about in the woods gathering berries and no beast offered to hurt her. On the contrary, they came up to her in the most confiding manner. The little hare would eat a cabbage leaf from her hands. The deer grazed beside her. The stag would bound past her merrily, and the birds remained on the branches and sang to her with all their might. I wish you could have seen her, kind reader, as you too would have been struck by her natural beauty and grace, without match in the whole wide kingdom by the inland seas. Word of this delightful maiden and her honeyed customs soon reached the ears of the gallant and well-renowned knight, Sir Ratanicus the Bold. So struck by the bucolic images conjured for him when told of this charming cottage and its even more charming inhabitant, Sir Ratanicus struck out on a quest to find the lady that so filled him with visions of wonder and charm. Sir Ratanicus traveled many long, weary days to find this dear cottage, so many that when he finally arrived upon it, he looked no more than a tired peasant in need of his supper and a good rest. Kind Isabel, seeing the plight of such a weary adventurer, bid him graciously join her at her repast, which Sir Ratanicus gladly did. After enjoying a lovely meal and even more lovely company, the ever-gracious Isabel did bid Sir Ratanicus, whom she still did not realize to be a grand and noble knight, to make for himself a comfortable bed in the sheep barn adjacent to the little abode. Gladly the knight did so, and spent a splendid evening discoursing and conversing with the beautiful Isabel before bidding her good night and retiring to his rest. As one could imagine, dreams of the exquisite lady of the cottage so filled Sir Ratanicus's head that evening he awoke much rested and with a plan to woo Isabel most stalwartly. Why, thought the knight, with much gladness, I shall enter into the grand tournament next fortnight and pit myself against the strongest knights and nobles of the land, and finding him myself so finely inspired, I shall assuredly win for this gentle lady a kingdom. Thus, feeling sprightly and renewed, Sir Ritanicus bid his adieu to the Lady Isabel and took himself directly to the tournament grounds in order to practice his skills most thoroughly. On the eve of this grand tourney, Sir Ritanicus bid a messenger to hie themselves to the darling little cottage and escort Isabel to the tournament grounds, so that she may partake in the festivities therein planned. Curious and slightly bemused, Isabel did accompany the richly clad messenger to the gallery of nobles, where she was welcomed and much merry was made. Little did she know, faithful reader, that this day would bring such changes to her demeans and prominence that she felt no worry or hesitation at the outcome, cheering all the noble combatants and chattling cheerfully with the company she sat amongst. Brightly appointed knights fought with fiercely shod stallions, finely honed swords and spears, and other accoutrements of war and tourney that were brought forth that day upon the hallowed tourney fields of Eldemir. Blows were exchanged, opponents were vanquished, and all fought tremendously to win honor for their consorts. But none fought so hard as Sir Ritanicus himself. With every sword thrust, he exceeded his opponent's skills. With every spear deflected, he rose higher in the tourney ranks until he finally bested each and every other knight on the field that day. Called then to kneel in front of Queen Kayla and her consort King Trumbrand, Sir Ritanicus was presented with the most glorious prize of all, the right to make whomever he felt worthy the honor of the princess of this ancient realm. Of course, dear readers, we know upon whom he would call, but his beloved Isabel was quite unaware of the planned outcome of this noble tourney. Blithely chit-chatting away with all the new friends and boon companions she had made that day, as Isabel could not enter an interchange between strangers without so impressing them with her grace and great humor that they would all declare that she was their most adored acquaintance and vow to her everlasting friendship. Isabel did not notice the heralds calling for her attention on the aforementioned assemblage. Not only were the heralds exclaiming her name for all to hear and remark upon on, but the crowds of onlookers took themselves up the hue and cry and began to call out to her as well. Of course, once aware of the kerfuffle ensuing, Isabel made much haste to attend to the queen, and she was a dutiful and trustworthy servant of the crown, and had often been known to offer wise counsel to them in the past. 
As she approached the royal presence, she noticed the, Sir, the intrepid Sir Britannicus, who was still kneeling upon the ground in front of the queen. She had been observing him throughout the day and felt that his honor, handsomeness, and chivalric display upon the field had made him worthy of her love and devotion. The best part, though, dear readers, was when Sir Ritanicus lifted him up the visor of his gleaming helm and revealed himself to be the humble wanderer that she had offered to aid so many days ago. So overwhelmed with delight and joyousness at the stunning and yet how somehow predictable event, she instantly embraced him and kissed him full upon the cheek. Queen Kayla was jubilant that her tourney was not, not only causing an heir to be decided on for her kingdom, but the path of true love had once again led to a happily ever after. Or so it seemed. For we all know, dear readers, the path of true love is often fraught with the bumps, ruts, and poorly placed horse droppings of life. And the fact would soon be discovered by the happy couple themselves. Thus, we start on the second chapter of this tale, the not-so-happy in-between part of the reign of Queen Ritan uh, Queen Isabel and King Ritanicus. One afternoon, while reading contentedly in the gardens of the Palace of Eldemir, surrounded by the blooming trillium flowers of the spring and enjoying the cheerful twittering of the friendly birds in the trees, did a herald of the land enter the garden, disrupting the tranquil scene. Now, Queen Isabel, known across the land for her gentle demeanor and kind words, did not offer ire or chastisement to the herald, but did kindly encourage him to speak freely to her. The herald's words, given to her directly from the hands of the alchemist extreme himself, told of a dire threat to her kingdom. A plague of such consequence that should their majesties not require all of their citizens to return to their dwellings and refrain from vi visiting others post-haste, all would be at risk of succumbing to this dread plague. Of course, we all well know by now Queen Isabel was quite wise and scholarly, and King Ritanicus understood the need to take heed of the, this beloved companion when she offered words to him. Thusly, they did declare the whole land of Eldemir to be secluded, and that no festivals or gatherings were to occur until word was given of a relief from this dire calamity. Much as they themselves were distressed by this edict, the kingdom hated their wise words and locked themselves away and entered the dark days of the plague. But fear not, lovely readers, for there was a light in the darkness of this long, long period of sorrow and woe. For Queen Isabel and King Ritanicus did cause for a magical new means of communication to be created by the alchemist extreme, and much did the people rejoice. With the advent of this confabulation, nobles and gentles throughout the land were able to laugh and make merry with each other without having to leave their seclusion and safety. Teachers could once again teach, bards could again sing and entertain the populace, and the people could partake in new and graceful dances with each other, prancing like horses about their gardens. Why, there was even one duchess who spent many hours teaching silly games of jousting and tourney with fermented hops, and one baron and baroness did recreate many tales from their majesty's youth for her delight and the delight of the land. Nowhere in the known world was there such joy and comfort offered to the most humble and lofty alike, and no kingdom felt such love and solace from their king and queen as did the kingdom of the wolves. Other kingdoms wept in envy and dutiful service of the lupine crown, and many tried to emulate them, but it was never as fine as that completed by King Ritanicus and Queen Isabel. And then finally, after so many months of darkness and gloom, the sun rose again on the stalwart kingdom and just in the nick of time, I might add. The king and queen had grown tired and were worried from, worry from the heavy burden that they had carried for months, the burden of not being amongst the loyal people and receiving all the hugs they desired. But as history tells us, dear reader, there was a tremendous transformation in the battle against the plague. No longer were folk locked in their little cottages and majestic palaces. With a simple dose or two of this magical potion and a tiny, tiny kerchief worn across their faces, the people were freed. They could once again enter and gather during the day, and it was resplendent. The sun shone more brightly than ever, the birds sang louder than they had ever been heard before, and the horses were more bedazzlingly caprisoned than had ever been seen in the days past, and the queen moved freely amongst her people again, embracing them most heartily. Soon it came for fall to change the colors of the leaves, and the farmers to harvest their crops, and the markets and shops to offer the fruits of the field once more. And as ever, the tradition amongst all the excitement of the turn of the seasons, another tourney was held, and a new prince and princess were found amongst the armed might of the kingdom. 
with joy in their hearts and hope for the future of this kingdom. King Ritanicus and Queen Isabel finally got their happily ever after, reigning peacefully and with much joy until the end of their days. When it was time, Prince Roak and Prince Harokin ascended the lupine thrones and took up the mantle of the crown. Therefore, and to prevent the tale of King Ritanicus and Queen Isabel from falling far from the thoughts and hearts of their beloved Eldamir, wise King Roak did bestow upon Ritanicus the title of Count, and upon Isabel the title of Countess. The great honor was given to them at the coronation of King Roak and Queen Harokin, whilst they did visit with Ritanicus and Isabel in the wild woods of the north, on the feast day of St. Anastasius the Magician, in the year 56. King Roak and his inspira inspiration, Queen Harokin, went forth and had many merry adventures. But that, dear listener, is a story for another day.